I'm Sean Delaney, and today on the What Got You There podcast, I sit down with Denise Scholl, who is the founder and CEO of The Rethink Group. Now, The Rethink Group is an elite team of risk performance and strategy advisors. Now, they work with people like Wall Street traders and Olympic athletes to make better decisions, improve on their mental mistakes, and how to develop confidence in their craft. Now, Denise truly is a legend in the field of elite performance at that level. Now, on today's episode, you're going to learn the X factor of human performance, why you can't make a decision without emotions, and how to understand your emotions to make better decisions in the future. Please enjoy this conversation with Denise Scholl. What Got You There is a podcast for high achievers looking to learn from the most successful people of all time, what their strategies, lessons, and routines are that made them successful. Now it's your journey, so it's time to learn what's going to get you there. Denise, welcome to What Got You There. How are you doing today? I'm well. Thanks for having me. No, I'm, I'm very excited to dive into this. Are, are you ready to, to dive right into it? Sure. Why yeah. not? <laughs> All right. What is the X factor of human performance? <laughs> the ability to use one's feelings and emotions as information. Interesting. So, <laughs> so, so, so we're not getting rid of emotions and feelings. It's a myth. It's like a flat earth myth, honestly, that is still perpetrated in way, way, way too many places. Like literally... Science has basically known for more than 20 years that we cannot make a single decision without emotion. Like, this is not new news in the scientific community, but the world doesn't know it yet. Um, I.e. why I use the flat earth analogy. So like some of the original experiments were with people who are brain damaged in such a way that they don't have emotion. And in most cases, they're institutionalized because they can't take care of themselves because you don't have that sense of what's the better thing to do or the right or wrong thing to do. Like you can't decide which day to make an appointment on because you have no feeling of like what suits your schedule. You can't decide what shirt to wear because you have no feeling about what suits the occasion. So, but, you know, people think the mind is flat. Why do you think that is? Why do people have such a hard time coming over to this? Um, well, for one, it's confusion. You know, people will uh, feel strongly about something and say or do something that they later regret. So it looks like the emotion is the problem. It's not. It's the acting out of the emotion. It's like taking that energy and doing something and then the thing wasn't necessarily productive. But if they understood that the emotions have information and the way to handle them is to understand what the message is and what's relevant to the situation versus what may be relevant like to your life, to your future safety, to your self-image, because that's where the energy energized parts come from. But so it's a superficial look at it. And that again, it's a flat, like you know, you stand on the beach in Florida and you look at it and you think it's flat, right? So you assume it's flat. So you look at your behavior and you say, well, you know, I felt really strongly, you know, I said this thing I didn't mean to, or I, you know, did this thing that later. So it looks like the ocean looks flat, but that's not really what's happening. And then, I mean, the idea is perpetrated, you know, it's perpetrated through cognitive psychology, use your thoughts to change your behavior. It's perpetrated through positive thinking, like, None of it's the way it actually works. Like, then expand on positive thinking. What does everyone have wrong around positive thinking? <laughs> like, people say all the time, your thoughts create your feelings. I mean, I want to swear because it just makes me so. It's not true. Like, your feel, your feelings are like, your feelings are the context you bring to everything. They're the filter through you, through which you perceive everything. And an expected feeling is why you do something. Like your thoughts can influence, but they don't come first. They just look like they come first. So people say it, people believe it. Like, and it, the negative feelings, the opposite of positive, which is what you really ask me. In their pure form are meant to give you information. Mm -hmm. 
like fear in its pure form meant to say, you know, there's something worthy of paying attention to and being prepared for. Like, that's its point, right? Like, no one would graduate from any school, except maybe people who are, you know, beside, you know, bizarrely brilliant, if, without fear, because you'd never do the work. You know, you would just do the fun stuff, but you're afraid of what happens if you don't do the work, you get the bad grades, you don't graduate, whatever. Like, so you do the work. Like fear in its pure form is meant to give you information. You know, I live in a ski town. Like fear of jumping over the cornice keeps me from doing it because I'm not sure I'm still agile enough to do it. If I had no fear, maybe I'd just do it, you know, and break my leg. Like every feeling, but particularly the negative feelings have some piece of information for us. Hmm. So what happens is, you're not supposed to feel them. You're supposed to set them aside. Well, your psyche turns the volume up. Like the feeling actually gets worse. Science has shown this over and over and over that if you put the feelings into words, you get more information, you choose better because you act them out less. You're like extracting the information from them. If you tell yourself not to feel things, you know, like sort of a summary version of positive thinking, like just be positive. The feeling usually gets worse. And if you still try to suppress it, you act it out. So you do the very thing you didn't want to do. I mean, I could go on and on, but I'll stop. No, no, no. You, you, you have space a, to talk. Yeah, yeah. You, you've got a line I love. If you can face your unconscious anger, you can get anything you want. What do you mean oh. by that? <laughs> Well, that is definitely diving in the deep end of the pool. Um, <laughs> That's where, where I like to I swim. Even, Come on, Denise. <laughs> so where do I even start? Um, so I'll start a little bit with how I learned that. Yeah. 22, 3, 4, 5 years ago, I don't exactly remember. I was sitting in a class taught by what's called a modern psychoanalyst, which is different than a Freudian psychoanalyst. I mean, they believe in an unconscious but they don't necessarily believe in interpreting, you know, this happened to you as a child, so therefore you do this as an adult. They believe in having different emotional experiences that you can then draw on. But in any event, I found out that Hyman Spotnitz, who was a psychoanalyst, and well, he died in the 90s, but he worked through them. But like in the 50s and 60s was did most of his work, that he had figured out he could have a positive impact on schizophrenia, by helping people who were diagnosed paranoid schizophrenics get in touch with anger they were afraid of. Mm. He had this hypothesis that they had had, you know, basically rage created in their growing up circumstances, that they were afraid that they would act out. So they like split it off into different personalities, basically. And that by coming to terms with the fact that they had this extreme form of rage, they wouldn't need to have multiple personalities. And in that class in 2001 or whatever year that it was, when the instructor was talking about this, a guy across from me who I knew to be a cartoonist for the New Yorker, and I'd known him for you know six, eight weeks in this class. He said, yeah, I was formally diagnosed paranoid schizophrenic in and out of Bellevue on like 18 medications, I was like. So I learned that unconscious anger can create extreme personality distortions. And in much lesser circumstances, it tends to manifest in extreme self-criticism. Mm. And if someone could, because it functions as a defense mechanism, you're afraid of anger because you're afraid what will happen if you act it out. So you turn it on yourself by being hyper self-critical. And if one could recognize that, they are able to be more of the self that they really are. Like, so in my personal case, um, same modern psychoanalyst, a couple of years later, told me that I was angry about being given up for adoption because I was born to a 16 year old runaway, given up for adoption at birth. And I was like, no, I'm not. I mean, she went on to have five more children. You know, none of them went to college. I grew up like where my father supported a private school education in college. Like, why? And the modern psychoanalyst was like, it's not how you feel about it now. It's like how the baby felt about it, like being essentially, you know, 
ripped for lack of a better word from their mother. And I was like, but I am telling you from the day I started to accept that, which was the process. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I hope we can dive into that process in a minute. Well, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to remember the details, but <laughs> I mean, at first I was like, no way, no way. Like, I wouldn't have wanted to be raised by her, but that's my perspective on her life. You know, at that point it was like 40 years later or something, you know, that wasn't the perspective of the infant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm probably sitting here now because of that, because I wasn't working as a, as a coach slash you know, I kind of work as a psychoanalyst, even though I don't have a license because I've been trained by so many psychoanalysts. Yeah, you should be selling computers for IBM right now, right? <laughs> I might have been, although I figured that out on my own. Like, who cares if anybody buys another mainframe? Um, I would have gone to Stanford Business School. That would have been sort of cool. But I also wouldn't have a master's degree in neuropsychoanalysis if I go on to Stanford Business School, I don't think. Um, anyway, I've learned... You know, I am constantly judging how willing my clients are to feel their anger and understand it. And I can basically tell you the ones that are get in their own way less and the ones that aren't get in their own way more. Mm. Denise, how hard is it to, to break through that initial bit of ice to get them to actually be willing to explore their anger, their feelings, their emotions? It's, it's so individual dependent, Yeah, you know, it's is, so is there anything you can do as a coach or is it, Hey, that person just needs to take responsibility for that. Oh, there's lots of things you can do. I mean, this is part of how we use modern psychoanalysis. Um, I mean, one is, you know, standard mirroring the person, like, in other words, not really trying to change their perspective. Um, Modern psychoanalysts would also call that joining them. So I can think of at least two clients that I've had for, you know, one, three or four years, another one for only like a year and a half, where they're just not willing to admit hmm. their anger. Like they always, ra what people do is rationalize it. Like say, oh, it's fine, or it makes sense, or it doesn't bother me, or, or they turn it onto something else. Like one client I'm thinking of now rationalizes it. One definitely turns it on to himself. But I've learned through the modern psychoanalyst that you just make it worse if you really try to change their perspective. So what I do is, is I put myself in their shoes and I understand how, how they would be doing what they're doing, rationalizing or turning it on themselves. And I empathize with that. And then I try to find ways to speak to their unconscious, if you will, which is usually in the form of throwing out a question. I wonder if it could be, and then seeing if that question works on their unconscious over time. And so what I tend to see, and when I think of these two people that I'm thinking of, one of them has sort of gone in and out of awareness. Like on certain days he would, be willing to say, yeah, I understand that I'm being hyper self-critical, you know, because I really don't want to have these other feelings because people are afraid. The number one, they're afraid if they feel the anger, that like, it'll just be all consuming. Have you found that to be true? It's not, but that's what people are afraid of. Then they're afraid if they act it out, they'll act it out and what will happen. Hmm. Like I can think of an athlete that I've worked with. Well, two actually. Um, lots of anger. One of them can channel it a little bit better. Is that healthy? It's better if you're conscious and channel it. Hmm. You know, then if you're if you're if you're not conscious of you're doing it, but you are doing it. I mean, it's it's better. I mean, if you're it, you know. If you're not channeling it somehow, consciously or unconsciously, you're probably beating yourself up so badly that you you know you couldn't be a professional athlete, mm -hmm. right? Or you would always be 
choking at the worst possible moment, but yeah. you know, which would curtail your professional athletic career. Um, but generally people are afraid if, if they feel it, they'll do something horrible or something kind of horrible will happen. Like they'll ruin their family's reputation. But none of those things are true. Like people are afraid of their negative feelings in general. They're afraid of feeling afraid. They're afraid of feeling sad. They're afraid of feeling disappointment. They're afraid of feeling frustration, anger. And what ha- what you find is if you just feel it, like nothing happens. Like you don't self-destruct. Like the, the walls don't come crashing in. Like, and you actually get information and in the process, you can validate yourself. Hmm. Like I have this feeling. Well, it's not, I shouldn't feel like this. I mean, I had a client texting me yesterday. Well, I shouldn't feel like this. Is it okay? I feel like this. I'm like, you feel what you feel. Let's find the information. If there's an emotional logic to absolutely everything. Hmm. But Did anyway, you- so people who are able to use, become conscious of their feelings about things that should not have happened to them, you know, in a perfect world, so to speak, like, they can use that as fuel to get more of what they want to be. And they don't need to turn it on themselves as a way to ex- unconsciously express it as opposed to being angry at whoever they should be angry at, which isn't to say that you realize you're angry because whatever, you know, your older brother, whatever it is, doesn't mean you have to go like, you know, tell your older brother you're mad at him and never speak to him again, or, you know, smack him. Doesn't mean you have to do it. Doesn't mean you have to act out any of it. But feeling and understanding it is a resource. Denise, could you walk me through what it's like in your head if you were to to feel one of these emotions? Call it fear. What What is, the, what is your process like internally? Oh, I'm just, I'm, I'm literally asking, what am I really feeling? So that's the and first why? thing. Fear sets in. You're you're stepping back. Well, and saying, I, I'll feel something. Like I might not know what, right? I just so feel first of all, I'm just gonna say this. I think of senses, feelings, and emotions as the same thing on a spectrum. They're physical. You know, you have some sense of right or wrong or some sense of intuition. And then you have something a little bit more intense that you might call a feeling, confidence or fear, you know, and something oftentimes, well, a little more intense to a lot more intense of emotion, you know, physical experience that's got information in it. So I tell everybody, be able to answer what is the feeling and why am I feeling it? Hmm. You might not kind of know it first. So I have a, a story I tell, and it's true, like this was... 2019, I got a call right around this time of year, actually, from a hedge fund manager that in the hedge fund, not famous in the general world, but generally everybody in the hedge fund world knows of this person. And they said they were underperforming, basically, and they felt like it was kind of a do or die situation. And, you know, could I come in and help them? And so I did. And I, I usually spend like two or three hours with the person the first time and we figured out what was really going on. And basically, because of the parameters, we were able to get that person on track relatively easily. But then I started to meet with them weekly in New York. And I realized like I was uncomfortable. And so I just do what am I feeling like? And then I finally realized I was intimidated by this person. And I went not by the person per se but by their position in the hedge fund industry. And if they ever went public about working with me, you know, it would burnish my reputation, you know, it would be good for me, right? And so what did I want? Well, first of all, I wanted that, you know, I was afraid of not getting it. Mm -hmm. And so then I was, I felt kind of intimidated, like, which by the way, wanting something and not getting it is like the story of my childhood, the people who adopted me, (laughs) I never had a hot bug Sunday until like my 16 year old boyfriend bought me one. Like I was only allowed to have a vanilla cone, but that's a whole other story, but, but, but maybe it's not, but whatever, I would end up going to that person's office. And like, as I'd walk in thinking, oh my God, I'm so intimidated. There's just feeling it. Now, everybody in the world would tell you not to do that, right? Because if you're really leaning into it, you're going to act it. 
it is the exact opposite. If you feel it and you put it into words, you can keep it a secret. And I can guarantee you, if we could get that person on the phone right now and say to him, do you think Denise Shaw is intimidated by you? He would laugh. He's like, are you kidding me? I'm intimidated by her, not a snowball's chance in hell. So I do, what am I feeling and why? Like, okay, the what was actually, I really wanted to do a good job and I really wanted this person to talk about me. So I had this desire and my fear that either, you know, either I'd blow that or it wouldn't happen or like that they could mean this to me. It was intimidating. Hmm. There's all kinds of research on what's called emotion granularity and emotion, well, emotion differentiation is the broader category and emotion granularity. So emotion differentiation is, can I tell the difference between fear, frustration, and disappointment? Now those are my categories, because those are the feelings, you know, there's all kinds of emotion categorization schemas, but just say, can I tell the difference between fear, frustration, and disappointment? And then if it's fear or it's frustration, excuse me, can I give gradations of that? Mm. You know, like frustration, I'm, you know, annoyed, irritated, frustrated, angry, you know, enraged, like that's gradations. There's all kinds of research that shows that if you can do that, you're basically more productive. Hmm. Just knowing that you feel the things. I think it's like your unconscious is allowing your conscious to get some information. Now, there's a second piece to all of this. Um, if you think about most feelings, they actually have a future implication in them. Like fear, something bad's gonna happen and that's gonna be bad, right? I mean, in its most general terms. Confidence, it's gonna be fine. I mean, in its most general term. Mm -hmm. Both of those are future oriented. Basically, we can go through just about every feeling and find the future orientation. So, there's an expected emotion. Um, Brian Newton of Stanford, who's the expert in this, calls it anticipatory affect. We are anticipating a future af affective state, affect being the psychology word for how you feel. Basically. Um, well, if you start to understand yourself through what's your expected emotion, like you've all of a sudden got this lever that's just crazy powerful. Because it's that expected emotion that causes us to do what we do. So pretty much every action we're taking in the present is because of a future we're thinking about? Mm -hmm. So cognitive neuroscience will tell you now, at the cutting edge of cognitive neuroscience, they will tell you that everything the human brain does is predictive. Mm -hmm. So by the way, advice not to predict is like a waste of time because... We're always predicting. <laughs> like if you weren't, you're predicting the next words that are going to come out. 100%, yeah. I've yeah, got yeah. a few different stories so like, up here, which way Denise going, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just give up the don't predict thing. It's it's a waste of time because you can't help it. Um, I mean, it's happening subconsciously. But you know, everybody has that experience where like you barely see something out of the corner of your eye or you barely hear something like, you know, and then it caused you to think something you turn out to be right. Mm -hmm. Like that's, you, you You've ever, you've gotten a little bit earlier in your conscious cycle so that like you wouldn't necessarily notice, you know, like maybe my dog walks by out there, you know, or he's not, but oftentimes when I'm doing these, he's out there like, let me in, let me in, you know, but I might see that out of the corner of my eye, but most of the time you're not conscious of it. Yep. In any event, the cutting edge of neuroscience, of cognitive science, never mind affective or anything to do with emotion, knows where everything is a prediction. Mm. So like just, go with it like you know um and particularly a prediction of our future safety so we're constantly analyzing like, That's is like this the, good or bad the underlying one future yeah, safety. It's, it's the it's the most core thing so okay. even if you take you know this polarized world we live in now and everybody complains about how nobody listens to anyone and you know can't have any rational debate well what's happening is as people start to hear something that's different than what they believe, it scares them. Mm -hmm. Because if you have to learn that, you know, something's completely different than what you believe, 
Like maybe you made the wrong decisions. What does it mean for the decisions you are making? Like, what does it mean for the implications you've already put in place? Like it's scary if you're wrong. So people just shut down and don't listen to information that's different what what they believe because they, it tells them that maybe they're in a less safe position and they don't want to hear it. So, I mean, it's amplified obviously by the fact that with social media, you can you know stick with your group that already believes what, but at its core, you know, when people found out the earth was round, it was scary. You know, if people find out now their own emotions, their, their decisions are based on their emotions, their emotions have information. It's kind of threatening if you've spent your life trying to not pay attention to your emotions. Mm. Speaking of that, I mean, so many people have spent a life not trying to pay attention to their emotions. One of the things it seems like within your work is, is you really go super deep on self-awareness. Am, am I correct there? So I'm thinking about when you start working the, with someone. Well, yes, but only if the person's willing. I mean, as I said, to, I was talking to an HR person at a, a big fund I work with that I never met her before. And I was trying to explain to her the difference between you know, guiding someone who wants to know versus working with someone who says they want to know, but don't really want to know. Yeah. So What's the difference? <laughs> oh, how I interact with them. Like, I will not force it on anyone. Yeah. Like, I mean, if people come to me to work with me, they know they're going to be talking about how they feel. I mean, yep. I, I mean, I did, I do have a new client actually who told me his, he runs a trading firm and he told me his wife found me. And I said to him a week ago today, I guess, so how much do you know about me? Well, not really anything. I'm like, okay, well, let me just prepare you. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's like, oh, okay. You know, my wife thinks it's a good idea, so I'm going to do it. Um, but mostly people know they're going to talk about how they feel. And mostly it's one of those things where if you dive into it just a little bit, you start to see the benefit. Mm. So it does take on like a life of its own, meaning that people tend to want more of it because you're really not only getting to know yourself, but validating yourself. Yeah. Go further like you, there. To respect your own feelings is to give yourself the respect that we all want from other people. I mean, it might as well start with ourselves. Like there is an emotional logic to everything. And I mean, I've had very, very, very many conversations where people have feelings that in order to do anything about them, in order to say, okay, I want it, this is telling me I need to change this. It is going to be tricky because of like the job situation they're in and the people they work with or whatever. Like you have to come up with a well thought out set of strategies and tactics. What people tend to do is think, well, I can't do anything about this. You know, I can't, I can't tell the chief information officer or the chief investment officer that his partner is behaving really badly in this situation because they've been partners forever, for example. Yep. What people tend to do with that expectation that they can't do anything is decide not to feel the feeling. Mm. Decide to not look. That's not the best option the best is for any of us to see our situations as truly and accurately as we can and understand the feelings we're having because when we do that we inevitably find small tactics and strategies that we can execute to move the ball in the direction we need it might not solve the whole problem yep. but it solves a little bit of the problem yeah you're trying to chip yeah. away little bits here to, to yeah get close. but it you have to respect the information your feelings are giving you to be able to do that. And then if nothing else, you know more of what you want to do and why you want to do it. Even if you can't do something about it today. And then your unconscious kind of works on it and you find circumstances, you know, changing ever so slightly. Mm -hmm. But if you don't validate yourself, no one else can do it. You, know? you said something like 30 seconds ago around doing the things and I'm pretty sure that's what you said around what you actually want to do. Was it, was I correct there or, or something mm -hmm. alluding to that? How have you find that synchronicity with doing what you actually want to do with the high performers? Are they pretty in alignment? 
doing exactly what they want to do. Do you, you, you see what I'm, I'm trying to get to here? Mm -hmm. I never thought of it, about it exactly that way. Um, Don't worry, I'll, I'll bill you at the end. No, fair enough. Um, <laughs> I think the more we understand ourselves, like, oh, here's a phrase I'm always using, by the way, no judgment. Like if I text the two words, no judgment once a week, I text it a dozen times a week because I've got a text from a client or former client or you know somebody that I only see once a quarter now and, you know, and they'll be trying to sort out some situation and I'll be like, well, let's first get sorted out how you feel and remember no judgment. Um, now, what I know and what the research shows is that people who can understand I'm sorry to sound redundant, what they're feeling and why they're feeling it, their odds of choosing the behaviors that get them more of what they want improve. They're able to spend their time and energy more effectively in service of whatever their goals and objectives are. Hmm. So, but the reason I paused with the question is there are plenty of people who are successful who don't do this? Yeah. They could just be more successful if they did. Hmm. Like they have strategies, they have defense mechanisms for getting in their own way. Like that they, which oftentimes amount to work hard. Yeah. yeah. Which out, oftentimes amount you to see that power. All those <laughs> yeah, but so here's the thing. <laughs> that works in professional sports. It probably works in marketing and sales for the most part. It does not work in markets. Like in markets, your job is to react to what other people are doing and what other people will do over time. You can't make anything happen. Mm -hmm. Your job in sports or marketing and sales or product development or running a company is to make stuff happen, to do the right things that will likely cause something to happen. Markets are completely different. This is why I will talk about how they're a completely different mental game. Like your job is to react appropriately. Hmm. to what other people are doing it's a completely different game anyway i think that, i answered the question but... no, 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 it, it, interesting for sure so is it really challenging for you if you have let's call it an elite athlete entering the markets as opposed to someone without that elite athlete background entering the markets um well i haven't had a resist psychologically resistant athlete asked me to help them trade better effectively gotcha but it probably would be harder hmm. i mean on the flip side i've had i mean part of the reason we started working with athletes at all is we had so many clients who had an you know either an athletic background or they had children you know they were developing into elite athletes or like john burns who works for me he was He's a golfer, an Illinois amateur champion or runner up to Illinois amateur champion. He's a pretty good golfer. Um, he had done like everything in the mental game, worked with everyone in the mental game, and then finally found us and like said this perspective was completely different. And he learned, by the way, a thing that people usually learn is then how to use their intuition. Because intuition is your expertise, if it's true intuition. It's like the feeling an expert or a relative expert has that you don't have when you're a novice or an amateur. Because why? You've spent time in the realm. And I don't care. It doesn't matter what realm it is. Yeah. So knowledge goes from very conscious, linear, step by step. You know, it gets shoved down basically into your body where you just have a sense of what's right and wrong or how to do something. So John said that he was never really allowed to use his intuition in his trading because so many people say not to, and like all of behavioral finance says not to. And, like, but, and this is, by the way, always true with portfolio managers. They know it's there, but they don't trust it and they're suspect of it. And so then they do and then they don't. And, um, but learning to recognize the physical sense of true intuition Athletes should be better at that. I probably haven't worked with enough of them to make a, you know, an assessment. But 
I'm curious then you mentioned true intuition. So actually having like a, a good amount of great intuition that can make better decisions here in the future. How do you get people to assess out whether they actually have true intuition or not? We we know plenty of people in the investment industry who think that they've cultivated true intuition, but I think you and I would, would agree probably have not. How 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 do you get them to well, understand? Well, the first that? thing is true intuition is just calm. It's like I just know, like I don't. You don't you don't have this urgency to do something. Hmm. So that's the first. Like, is it calm or is it like urging you to do something? Now there are moments where intuition will tell you to do something. Um, but you could analyze those moments like where it did have to be right that moment. Um, I have people grade their, um, all of their feelings, particularly, I mean, their conviction, you know, how confident are they? But putting those negative feelings into words and understanding what they're really about, because when you do that, you externalize them and it leaves you more with a calm sense of what you really think. Mm. There's also, so like, uh, hopefully I can describe this. Like you do your analysis, you use your expertise in whatever area, right? Like yep. you're working in. And then some sense of what's going to happen that kind of drops out of that. And you have some level of conviction or fear around, is that sense right? Like, are you going to move forward? Well, I think of it as a, as a conviction spectrum, but like fueling that, are fears that are irrelevant to the decision that are about you and are about, for example, an expectation that the same mistake will happen again. So you want to be able to untangle that, like it's a bowl of spaghetti, you know, like which feeling is what? So we're back to what am I feeling? Yeah. And why am I feeling it? And hopefully you're going to have multiple feelings. Like, and you can go, well, this one is the feeling about the market per se, or the business decision, or the athletic decision to train today or not. So just an example of that. So many people know that I work with the snowboard cross racer, Lindsay Jacob Ellis, who last year won two gold medals in her fifth Olympics. Part of how she won those medals is in the five years that we worked together, she had the courage in the two weeks before the Olympics last year to tell her coach she wasn't racing because they were racing on a course, I don't remember, it was one week or two weeks before the Olympics that she thought wasn't well prepared, was too icy, and it wasn't worth the risk for her. She said, you know, she was 35 or 36 last year, back when she was 20, she didn't have the courage to listen to herself that that course is too dangerous. Hmm. She'd finally come to respect her own feelings and just say to her coach, I'm not doing it. It's too dangerous. The Olympics are next week. It's my last Olympics. I'm not doing it. So she knew that it was right for her, like to not race in that. Her One of her teammates got seriously injured. Hmm. Um, and she, much to everyone's complete amazement, even though she was more than well deserved to do it, you know, won not one, but two gold medals. Was it to her amazement too? I don't think that it was. Talk to me about that, that inner, inner confidence. Um, she is a perfectionist. She's also a very strategic racer that she maps you know, these courses. I don't know if you step border cross racing is these crazy courses up and down and all around and they have these complicated start sections and whatnot. She thinks through those courses, like step by step by step by step. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, she's a perfectionist, which the flip side of perfectionist is kind of hyper self-critical, right? Mm -hmm. That's the part I'm not saying. I mean, I just said it, but that was the flip side of that. I actually saw her last year at New Year's, but right, I, I put her on a plane to go to Russia to then go to the Olympics. Um, I think we'd spent five years with her working on what she's feeling and why, and she was just able to believe she could still do it. Mm -hmm. And she not only didn't race the week before, she told US Ski and Snowboard that she wasn't gonna do the press junket. So she's, 
you know, 2006, she was about to win the gold medal. She flipped her board. She fell. She only won the silver. She'd been excoriated for that for all those years since 2006. And so every time the Olympics would come around, the press would be like, are you, this is the year you're going to finally redeem yourself from making that mistake, you know? And she's just like, you know what? I don't need to like sit in front of them and have me make them make me feel bad about that again. Like, I'm just not doing it. So she had an inner, inner sort of strength which I think it was, it was respecting her own feelings mm -hmm. and respecting in knowing that, you know, she put herself in that situation, the press would agitate her. She just didn't need to waste energy on that. Mm -hmm. And so she didn't where before she wouldn't have, she wouldn't have felt like, you know, she validated herself. She wouldn't have felt like she had the right to tell her coach that neither was she racing the week before, nor was she sitting through the press asking her for the, you know, fifth time or fourth time, like, and so what? That she was centered in herself and what hard she needed that to, get to, to do. It's hard. Yeah. I'm I mean, it's that. particularly hard. It's hard for people who are perfectionist and have, and who do want to cross every T and dot every I. And, you know, there's a lot out of their control. But what? It's like we were talking earlier even if there's nothing that you can do about what are you feeling and why, like you validating yourself gives you a, a strength that you mm. don't otherwise have. Because otherwise, the, what's the opposite of validating yourself? Like you're having thoughts and feelings you maybe don't want to have, you don't know what to do with, you vacillate back and forth, you know, they, they get you off your game a little bit. It's like static on a radio. Yeah. Not that any of us listen to the radio, anymore, but that's what it's like. You try to tell yourself not to feel a certain thing, but then you think or feel it. And then you're like, oh, I'm not supposed to go. Blah, blah, blah. It's all this wasted energy over here and noise, like literally noise in your head. You just, what am I feeling and why? And like, it's all okay. I just need to understand what it's telling me. Hmm. That That's one of the through lines is you do redirect and better use energy. Yeah, totally. You, yeah. Because- so Senses, feelings, and emotions are physical energy. Yeah. And the effort to like manage them, override them, suppress them, pretend they're not there, like uses a lot of energy. Yeah. Like what if you could just not have to waste that energy on trying to get rid of something you shouldn't even be getting rid of and you're not going to be able to get rid of. And oh, by the way, if you get rid of it, it's going to make it worse anyway. Mm. <laughs> Can you help me out with it? like a, a really tricky scenario and I'll use it across a few different disciplines. So say... You're, you're on the downward spiral. So it could be in athletics. You actually have not been performing well in the markets. You actually, your fund is down. You're not performing well. And based on near future outcomes, your job is at risk. So you might no longer have your starting position. You might get fired, whatever. How do you get those people to be in a better state during those times where they have mm -hmm. very limited opportunities to actually right this ship? Yeah. So we first just walk through what the worst that can happen, like literally. And we expose their catastrophe fantasy because it's always there. Mm -hmm. It's usually worse than losing the job. Mm. In fact, I've never heard it not be worse yeah. than losing the job. <laughs> well, except for one client who's sort of resistant, one of the two people I was talking about before. Um, <laughs> but it's never just even lose the starting position or, or lose the fund. It's, yeah. and then my wife will leave me. My yeah. kids will hate me. My, you know, parents will say, I told you so. There's always these, all these predictions. Well, oftentimes when people expose the catastrophe scenario, they realize that it's, it's either unlikely in total or it's unlikely anytime, like right now. Mm. So then they feel like, okay, Maybe that'll happen, but it won't happen for, and so I have this window to operate in. That right there will make them feel like, okay, I've got a window. I can work with the window and they can access some of their skills. So that's one part. The other part is oftentimes going back to when it started and understanding why it started and what feelings were going on then. So I mentioned that portfolio manager in New York that I was intimidated by in 2019. Mm -hmm. We did that. I, and I said it ended up helping him relatively quickly. It was because we went back to his beginning of what you might call a slump, understood what happened then, which were ancillary reasons. They weren't even market reasons. Mm -hmm. And he was able to see how that scenario made sense. What happened to him, however long it had been at that time, two or 
three years earlier. Um, and he was able to essentially forgive himself for this mistake earlier. And then he wasn't dealing with the feelings around that, that static we were just talking about yep, where you're yep. back and forth and back and yeah. forth. Like that went away. It was like, okay, this is what happened. You know, your risk manager did this. You, you couldn't fix it. Like it was in December. That really wasn't your fault. Like it was because he works for you, but it wasn't really like, and okay, let's, and that because slumps, by the way, start with a mistake that we beat ourselves. We think we made a mistake that we should have known better. And then we don't, we think we're supposed to think positive, set it aside, put it behind us. As my husband says, rub a little dirt in it. He was a, you know, athlete. He said, that's what his coaches used to tell him. Um, and so, but the feelings about it influence us. And so we keep making mistakes mm. and maybe we're mad at ourselves, beating ourselves up, like maybe, but at least we keep making mistakes because there's all this other static there. So you go back to the beginning, everything that happened in the middle doesn't matter. So on one hand, you're, you're understanding how you got to where you are. On the other mm. hand, you're seeing that you have a window that the worst that can happen is not probably not going to happen today. Yeah. But, but even if neither one of those work, I am terrified that if I don't perform today, I am going to lose my job. Yeah. Will help. Lindsay learned to say she's scared in the gate and her starts got her start times got better. Hmm. Ironically, like her coach thought I was crazy. Like you're going to tell her to like, she's in the gate ready to pull out and you want her to say she's afraid. I'm like, yeah, she is because her, her psyche is trying to say, you know, be careful. And if she lets her unconscious know her conscious knows it, she's going to be able to do what she can do as opposed to behave afraid. Yeah. You were mentioning um, the ancillary reasons that that slump usually begins. If you go back to the beginning, how often is it these things on the outside that don't deal directly, right? Like if you're a portfolio manager, it isn't an actual investment decision. It's uh, an issue you have with the family or something else. How often is it ancillary issues that directly impact our craft? Most of the time, but things are layered. So you mean there's like complicated? Some... <laughs> yeah, but not as complicated <laughs> yeah. as people think. There's some feeling about the market, about the trade that's legit, or at least information about the market, the trade. But then um, amplifying that feeling is feelings about ourselves, hmm. what's going to happen to us. Yeah. And so when I talked about pulling the spaghetti apart, like, or unraveling that, you're seeking to know which feeling is about the market. And by being able to hold the feeling about yourself, not necessarily get rid of it because mm -hmm. your brain's job is to keep you safe. So you're going to be worried about it. But if you know it, you can just go, okay, I'm worried that, which leaves me with this other feeling, which actually is about the market. It depends on the day and the person, what the general balance is like but people who are more conscious of all of their feelings particularly their feelings about themselves can keep the balance being about the situation at hand gotcha so it gets back to that granularity of understanding mm -hmm. those right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and so how deep do you actually have them go do you provide just a, like a, a list of phrases that they would use around emotions or do you want them actually coming up with their own Oh, I want people to come up with their own. I mean, I will give them feelings. Like I'll say, I don't know. I think what you're saying is you're despondent. Just off the, but I, I know that having a greater emotion vocabulary leads to you being able to be more nuanced about a given feeling. You know, mm -hmm. I let's say I'm chagrined as opposed to I'm mortified. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, by the way, variations on embarrassment. Um, the research consistently shows the more nuance you have, and it shows this for portfolio managers, by the way, the more portfolio manager can differentiate amongst their negative emotions, the more money they make. That's from a research study. That's not me talking. So I want, like when I do a workshop, I will get a group of people to think of all of the emotions related to their, whatever the subject at hand is. Mm -hmm. Now, 
they will usually put in all kinds of cognitive words and physical words like sick to my stomach, you know, my hands are sweating, you know, those are, those are physical manifestations of feeling. And according to one neuroscientist, a level one, you know, not really emotional awareness. So, but I do both. I try to get them to learn more words. I mean, I'll tell people to use a dictionary, use a second language, use um, slang. Mm. But as I talk with people, I will also often offer up a more specific, more nuanced emotion. And I, I do, I admit, I get a kick out of this. Most of the time they'll go, yes, that is exactly the feeling. Um, and I hope that in that process, I have, you know, improved their awareness of their own feeling. One of the things I'm intrigued about is, is behavior change, like actually changing habits and things like that. What have you seen actually works for effective behavior change? <laughs> knowing what you're feeling and why like if you really if you learn the pattern of feelings that cause you to behave in a certain way you can learn what those feelings are about and you can consciously feel them and when you do that you get more choices of behaviors it is easier to if nothing else compare two future feelings if I do this, it will likely feel like that. And if I do that, it will likely feel like that. And I would rather feel like that. So I'll do this. So like a simple example, pedestrian, although it may be, um, you know, I love a good vodka martini. When I was in my thirties and trading in Chicago and going to a bar called Jesse Livermore's, I could have pretty close to an unlimited amount of them over Friday night, which might be, you know, four or five over five or six hours or something, which is a lot, you know, and I was definitely tipsy. Like, would I still like to have at least three if I'm out at a party? Sure. Would I? Not a snowball's chance in hell. Why? Because I know now if I have one, I'm going to sleep badly. Hmm. You know, I do all the aura ring tracking yeah, and all yeah. of that. And if I sleep badly, I'm going to feel like crap tomorrow. Yeah. So I don't. So I'm choosing, wow, it'd be really fun to have a second or third martini. But it would be more fun to feel good tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So I don't. You know, that, how will this make me feel in the future? And choosing, like, you're actually just being conscious about what's really going on in your head. Mm -hmm. But when you don't know you're doing it, you'll almost always default to the feeling in the moment. Yeah, interesting. Denise, you work with so many high performers. You were just bringing up kind of uh, around alcohol effects and sleep and stuff like that. Is there anything else that, that you've taken from the people you work with to make you more effective? Uh, I'm so, I mean, this sounds so arrogant. It's revolting for me to even say it, but it's true. I mean, I'm just so all over, like, and have been really my whole life, like why people do what they do. That I think, I mean, like I learned a bulletproof coffee from clients, I guess you could say years ago. I had two clients in a very short period of time telling me they were drinking bulletproof coffee with butter and oil in the morning and fasting. I was like, what's that all about, you know? Um, so I went and investigated that. Um, I'm not sure I can think of anything else. Yeah, it's anything. To say that, but. Well, no, I, I'm just intrigued as well because you've worked with high performers across different domains, different disciplines. So I'm wondering what has become obvious to you over time about the best of the best and what they're doing that others aren't. You know what? I or how are think... they thinking? I don't actually think there's a a, a, a specific list of commonalities. People get to where they are in all sorts of different ways. Um, I mean, like the professional athletes that I dealt with, you know, their families either encouraged them to develop their craft or noticed how good they were. It, like Lindsay talks about playing t-ball when she was like five and being great at it. Now her older brother was already a snowboarder, so and she wanted to keep up with him. 
Um, I think people get to success in all sorts of ways. And I think there are all sorts of ways to do it. Like, you know, you read these lists about like, get up in the morning, you know, and do this and do that and do this and do that. You know, I've had a moderate amount of success. I get up in the morning, feed the dog, make coffee and sit down and, and start going through my email. Like there's not a list yeah. of what you need to do to be successful that says you should do that. But like, I know that people who were waiting for me to get back to them yesterday, I've gotten like, and then it clears my deck. And then I take a little bit of time and do some other stuff. Um, I, I think anyone can be somewhere between more successful to crazy successful if they learn to honor and respect themselves, which is gonna mean they understand themselves. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm going to say with no judgment, hmm. because that sets up this situation where then you can say, this is what I really want. You know, maybe the thing I really want is some crazy dream that's going to be 30 years from now or whatever. But I, this is what I, in a perfect world, if I could, you know, wave a magic wand. And then once you know that and you're like, well, I'm allowed to get that, you do little things hmm. that'll move you in that direction. You know, um, but, you know, work hard. I mean, what do I say? Like, if I, if I look at like the things you do have to do, and I realize it's in conflict to what I just said, but it's like in, in business, you know, this is a little bit different, but it's probably true in sports too. Like offer something different. You know, like Lindsay's thing was, she's very strategic about those courses, like offer something different, pay attention to detail. If nothing else, pay attention to detail and play the long game. It's not what happens today or tomorrow or next week or next month. But have the vision, something different. Deliver it, whether it's sports or portfolio management or any other sorts of business, with an uncommon detention to, attention to detail. Hmm. And give it time. I often liken it to rock climbing, even though I'm not really a rock climber. I mean, I've done a little of it. But it's like, if you're trying to accomplish something, particularly working for yourself. Like, you know, you grab a hold up here and then your foot sort of slide, you know, like, and you just have to, you know, and then you grab here, like, and it's not linear. It's mm -hmm. like, but if you have the vision, it's something different. You pay attention to tail and you play the long game. It turns into something. Speaking of rock climbing, have you seen the documentary Free Solo with Alex Honnold? I'm not, I know about it. I've never actually watched it. You know. I, I would love to get your take on, on what's going through his brain. So speaking of that, because, because you're always at the cutting edge of neuroscience, you keep bringing up the unconscious. I, I'm kind of just throwing this up there because I'm very intrigued by just your overall thoughts around it. Just just entertain me here for a minute and just give me some, some interesting things the way you think about the unconscious mind. Well, most of what we think and do and perceive and judge and decide is unconscious. David Eagleman wrote a book called Incognito and said it's all unconscious. Um, Freud was right when he said we have an unconscious. It's got things it's driving us towards, not necessarily in the Freudian drives, but then um, it matters. And he was also right when he said we will repeat things and get ourselves in repetitive circumstances. So now what there you are call some fractals, right? I call them fractals, yeah, because I think they really are, like fractal being like broccoli. So, you know, like one little snippet of broccoli, if you look at it, it's actually the same as the whole head in terms of what it looks like. It's just at a different scale. Mm -hmm. Well, so we learn these things about who we are in the world, how we have to behave to at least hypothetically get what we want yeah. or not get in trouble. And then as adulthood forms, we we have expectations about how things are going to work out in any given circumstance. And we react out of that expectation, which includes who we are and what we can get and what we can do. And then we create it like either by inducing other people to treat us in a way or limiting ourselves and our own options, you know, or, or criticizing ourselves if we're, if we're trying to get rid of another feeling. Um, A lot of what we think and feel is not really conscious. And we, 
we will consciously think it's something else. And oftentimes that thing will be a defense mechanism. So for example, there's a natural tendency of a child, if they're in a difficult circumstances to blame themselves. That's called the narcissistic defense. It's my fault that mom and dad are fighting. It's my fault that, you know, if I'd done good in school, mommy and daddy wouldn't be getting a divorce. So like to the child, it's actually healthy because the child is giving themselves a sense of agency, which mm -hmm. gives themselves a sense of control over a situation that's bad, but they can't control. You're supposed to lose that, you know, as you go through your teenage years and realize these things are not your fault. Yeah. But people don't know they have it. So they're blaming themselves for things that aren't really their fault and they're not able to see reality. And then they're reacting out of a way that says I'm bad or I don't deserve or whatever. All that stuff is unconscious. I mean, this is an example you asked me about the yep. unconscious. We could go on and on, but hopefully that's a little. No, no, no. I think that's a, a great preview of the unconscious. <laughs> I'm wondering though, is there anything you're doing to help navigate, in, influence the unconscious? I speak, I try to speak to my client's unconscious by throwing out a question here or there that they may not um, think is relevant or may not think is true, but. I try to um, plant a seed, so to speak. Are you planting any seeds Another, in, your, in yourself? Hmm, I might, I, nah, I might have been, but I mean, I've done so much work. I mean, I have a you know master's degree in how it is that Freud said we repeat behaviors, you know, and I did that in 1995. So I've done a lot of thinking about this. I do, um, oh, by the way, I do use dreams. Oh, um, I'm very intrigued by this, specifically yeah. this week. This keeps coming up for me. So this is my take on dreams. And I have clients who tell, will tell you this really works. It, the story does not matter. It does not matter how crazy the story is. Nothing matters. The only thing that matters is the sequence of feelings in the dreams. And what they could be telling you about what you really feel. So there will be symbolism in them. The stories will have sometimes have symbolism in them, but the, the story itself doesn't really matter. It's like, if that story were to happen, you would have felt like this, then you would have felt like this, then you would have felt like this, then it would have felt like this. That will tell you something about. So here's actually a funny story about dream interpretation and me and my background in conscious and unconscious. So I went, from working at IBM, I was supposed to go to Stanford Business School, blah, 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 blah. I quit. I went skiing. I got a job at Com Disco in New York, which I found out later on or in Chicago. I was the first woman in the first IBM where they ever hired. And they told me after I got there that I was an experiment. And I was like, great. Now, this was on my way to get into graduate school that I wanted to do. But um, so there turned out to be two other women there and like 60 guys. And I, I had this dream that we were at a Halloween party and the, the two other women and I we were all dressed as some sort of cat and they were hunting us with bows and arrows. And I woke up there, I knew nothing about nothing. I mean, I had some therapy, but I really knew nothing. And I was like, I've got to get out of here. Like, like I was right. Yeah. They were really, like we were all experiments, you know? Like, I mean, this was the late eighties, you know, and we thought we were, you know, liberated women and making decent money and all of that. But like, we were all experiments. It was not a great place to be. And like, it was equivalent to being hunted as cats and it wasn't safe and like, but I didn't know that, but it's true. That story was the situation and it, that dream gave me information that I didn't have. So the just, symbolism of it. Yeah. So are you actually each morning, like diving into your dreams after you've fed the dog and, and done all that? Or, or is this? No, kind of I, the truth is I sleep so deeply since I, did all this stuff that I oftentimes don't remember. Okay. I, if I have dreams that I do remember, there's chaos in them. And I, I'm like super organized. I'm not particularly into horoscopes, but I am a typical Virgo and then I'm very organized. And like, it's really hard to be organized when you have a small consulting business and there's too much to do and too few people. And, you know, there are papers on both sides of my desk. So I will have dreams that are like have chaos in them. And it will be like, it's just like, okay. This has got to be our to-do list. This are the nine things we have to do today. Like, I, 
Um, but I have I have a client who would say his life changed through interpreting his dreams. Interesting. But again, it's only the stories can be symbols. They're oftentimes really disguised. But it's if that happened, what would I feel? So like in the Tom Disco dream, if they were really hunting us with both it, bows and arrows, I need to be scared and I probably need to get away from them. Hmm. Interesting. You know, like it, it, their dreams are way more general than all these dream books will say. And so, so Denise, say you could do this. Like, this is what I love to do. Sit down, interview someone, just ask endless questions of it. If you could do this with anyone dead or alive, who would you be very intrigued to sit down with? Well, Hyman Spotnitz, who founded Modern Psychoanalysis. What are you going to ask him? Tell me more about how to help someone be conscious of anger they don't want to be conscious of. Hmm. I'm afraid to say this, and it doesn't say what you think it says or what people will think it says about my politics, but Hillary Clinton. Why I'm as that? independent as they come. I've literally voted for a Republican as many times as I voted for a Democrat. I mean, I think she's an incredible woman. Mm. Like, so I think she's just incredible. She's had incredible experiences. She's brilliant. I have met her. She's hysterical. Like, she's so funny, like, in real life. But to be able to really just talk to her one-on-one. -on -one, yeah. Um, probably Freud, although I'd be, yeah, I mean, I could come up with more, but Madame Curie, the scientist. Good list of four right there. Denise, <laughs> this, this has been a ton of fun for me. I, I love exploring your work. Obviously your book, Market Mind Games, uh, is incredible. I, I want to make sure the listeners can stay connected with you, dive further into, into your work and, and what you're currently doing with the Rethink Group. Where should we direct listeners? Um, so our website is therethinkgroup.net. If you don't do .net, you're going to find either an HR company or a Sunday school purveyor of educational materials. Um, I'm on Twitter, uh, fairly active, Denise K. Schull, um, my middle initial. Um, and I think that's it. Yeah. Well, as always, listeners, that'll all be linked up in the show notes. But Denise, thanks for joining us on What Got You There. Thank you for having me.